Today we're on Isha and we're doing a central heating and hot water installation on this house right there. And it's a quite large house, over 300 square meters, currently three boilers, two hot water unvented cylinders. And we have here some single glazing, unillustrated double brick walls, very high ceilings and double height lobby. The heat loss of the property is quite substantial. So what do you think? How many boilers and how many kilowatts of power do we need here to heat this property up and to do hot water? I think the answer to those questions will surprise you. So here we are in the lobby. Look at the height of this. Here we've got small toilet and we go to the cellar. Here in the cellar we've got 125 liters unvented cylinder and that does only a toilet on the ground floor and the kitchen. I don't think there's any need for that so I'm gonna remove that cylinder and reconnect ground floor to the new cylinder we're gonna install and put it on secondary circulation so they don't have to wait for hot water in the kitchen because there's quite a length of pipe work between the kitchen and our new location that I'm gonna show you now. Right there. In the loft we've got another unvented cylinder, 250 liters mega flow and three Supremas and they are about 20 kilowatts uh, heat input each. Those two Supremas, one and two, are doing heating. Two zones, ground floor and first floor. This one here, it does one unvented in the loft, another unvented in the cellar for kitchen and uh, toilet downstairs. And it also does tower rails. So we've got a total of one, two, three, four, five zone valves here and sixth zone valve in the cellar. Plus we've got a couple of pumps here and another pump here for hot water and there's also a secondary circulation pump for uh, the cylinder. So we've got a total of four pumps, six zone valves, three boilers, two unvented cylinders. And the idea is that we will simplify this setup. And in here we've got all the control panels. Heating in the loft, heating in the first floor of the programmer. There are additional uh, thermostats on the walls for those two zones. Ground floor, another heating zone. Power rails are on separate zones, separate controls. They're not thermostatically controlled. And secondary uh, return, which is the main cylinder in the loft. Hot water secondary return. I'm gonna call Peter. Take a marker and mark what's what. What's the first slider on the first programmer on top? Heating loft. All right, turn it on. I just realized my test might be meaningless. Half of the zone valves are latched open and they're faulty. Oh, well, hear that unhealthy noise? Zone valves closed, but both pumps are running. So maybe there are uh, contactors there but they're not wired correctly because every single pump's on, which shouldn't be the case. Actually, that noise, hear that? That's a faulty contactor. That's probably not separating the pumps correctly. Contactor or a relay, probably a relay. They said relays, faulty relay. They got, they coming out anyway. Tell you, nothing sounds healthy here. I'm sure the owners are glad this whole kit is going. Another thing that's kind of interesting is the fact that hot water boiler and tower rails are on a separate system. So they have their own filling loop right here. And then central heating on those two other boilers is another filling loop out there. Expansion vessel for that system. An expansion vessel for a system that does hot water and tower rails. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna connect them to one system just to simplify it all. One filling loop, one expansion vessel fewer zone valves. 
I think that's, I guess, is kind of interesting, is the fact that all those boilers were installed here in 97. That is what, 25 years. They've lasted 25 years. Oh, look at him. See that? That's really interesting. That comes from the flue that I'm just removing. If you look inside the flue, the boiler has been just on. There's condensation there. It's all wet. And this is corrosion that condenses it into aluminium flue liner. That pretty much tells me that this flue run was probably too long and the products of combustions were cooling too much before they reached the end of the flue and they were condensing inside the flue. So now we have a roof to repair. I've already repaired one flue. You can see different color tiles there. I'm gonna reuse the top one and I still have to repair this one here. Hope I have enough tiles. Look at those chimneys. Magnificent, aren't they? Amazing. I'm trying to carefully remove mortar, not to lose any more tiles, and to remove the flexi slate. Luckily, it's really soft. Right, the roof's done. I need to replace the slate, flexi slate, with a new one for Intergas. That's actually straight from Intergas, this one. So I'm gonna take the other one out and put this one in. Flue holes repaired, new flexi slate installed, new flue installed. So while I was fixing the roof and installing the flue, I kept Peter in a dungeon. Let's see what he's been up to. There used to be an invented cylinder here that we removed. And I'm reusing those two pipes there. They used to be flow and return going to the invented cylinder. We're gonna use them to supply hot water to the kitchen one of them and the other one for secondary circulation. Peter is flushing it. As you can see using a power flushing machine. It's quite hard to show it, but the water is actually relatively dirty, taking into the account that it was connected only to the unvented coil and one radiator uh, for a reason that I still can't understand, that radiator behind me. Obviously, if we disconnected it, we're not gonna be running hot water through a radiator that would make uh, very little sense. Now it was time for the fun part, assembling the plant room. Friday afternoon and I've got my pipe work finished. Obviously I'm hiding away my sitting there and the boiler. Give you more chance to guess what we are installing here. How many boilers, how many kilowatts, how many cylinders, how many liters of water. I think we've got four or five bedrooms here, four bathrooms, 300 square meters. So yeah, have a good guess. Leave a comment below and tell me what do you think we are installing here. We'll see if you get it right. We're gonna go back to the dungeon and see what Peter has done with the cylinder. And down here, the cylinder is gone, and those two pipes, that used to be flow and return going to the cylinder. Now, now this is our secondary circulation for hot water, and this pipe has been reconnected to the hot water that was coming out from the unvented cylinder. So, one cylinder removed, we don't need that cylinder anymore. However, I have found one problem. I thought we didn't flush the pipe work correctly and then I realized that when I turn the hot water on this little radiator here gets hot and as soon as I isolate the radiator the water is clean. Someone connected this radiator to the flow and return going to the old hot water cylinder so now I have to disconnect it and connect it back to central heating. Luckily not impossible just about maybe 10 meters of pipe to be run in the cellar to reconnect it to primary flow and return. But yeah, you can get caught out on things like that. And now we can finally reveal what we have installed at this property. Just one boiler, 27 kilowatts, one cylinder, 
200 liters. You probably start looking at that boiler and you think, hold on, that's a combi, right? But it doesn't have hot water connected. Not only it's a combi, but also it's connected to a hot water cylinder. You look further and you see, hold on, there's a three-port valve here going to the cylinder. Surely you can't do that. And if you look behind the cylinder, you also notice there's no thermostatic controls there, just an overheat stuff. By now you must be thinking I'm a right Muppet. Not only I connected uh, hot water through a radiator downstairs, but also did everything wrong in the plant room, right? Not quite, let me explain. This isn't an ordinary combi boiler, this is an Intergas exclusive. And Intergas is unique in a way uh, they manufacture their boilers. When you think about it, compare it to software, it's like Linux, it's open source boiler. You can use it as a combi if you want, you can use it as a system or you can use it as a heat only. And in here, we're using it as a system boiler because luckily for us, Intergas left all the functions of the system boiler in the software and on the connections on the PCB. Why is there cold water coming to it? Purely for an internal feeling look to fill the system up and the hot water is capped off. Now about the three port valve. It's not an ordinary mid position valve. This valve is a diverter valve, so it, uh, it's either open to port A or port B, it doesn't go to the mid position. The way we use it on hot water priority is, it's normally open to heating and normally close to the cylinder, and that way it acts exactly the same way as a two port valve and it satisfies G3 requirements. You don't need to put another two port. If the valve is not energized or if there's a overheat on the cylinder, that valve will go to its resting position and it will shut. If you think there is a reason why I should use a two port behind it, leave a comment because I personally don't see any reasons to do that. Safety cutout, high limit stat on the cylinder will close the valve and the resting position is shut. Now, with regards of not having thermostatic controls on the cylinder, it only looks like there aren't any. What we have there is a high limit stat and there is an NTC, which is a temperature sensor behind it, wired together with that high limit stat, going straight back to the boiler. So it gives the boiler actual temperature of the store. Now, this is the solution that uh, uh, Richard Barrows from Intergas shop came up with. And Richard, if you need anything Intergas, anything hot water priority, Richard is your man. And that's where I get my bits and pieces for hot water priority from his online shop. That valve prioritizes hot water. If there's a call for hot water, the boiler will open that valve to cylinder only and will cut off all the heating zones. It will also fire at preset kilowatt output and preset temperature that you can set in the parameters. When the hot water is satisfied, the boiler will revert to heating and it will fire, but it will be modulated. In my case, I'm using a weather compensator. This is a little uh, resistor that's installed outside and wired directly back to the boiler. And it modulates the flow temperature accordingly to the external temperature. Very simple principle. The hotter it is outside, the lower the flow temperature. And right now we've got it set quite high because at this property we've got old undersized cast iron radiators. But on a day like today, when it's 10, 12 degrees, that boiler fires at around 40, maybe 45 degrees, which is still quite high. But as I mentioned, we can't afford any lower curve because of the size of existing radiators and the huge heat loss of the property. And apart from this little weather compensating module, the whole system is controlled by two nests. So nest on my left controls hot water in the unvented cylinder and ground floor heating. And nest number two does heating on the first floor. And I've used a second connection that normally controls hot water to turn on towel rails. So why would you go for all this effort of installing hot water priority systems, which are a bit more complicated than what you are used to standard S or Y plants? The reason is efficiency. If we can run central heating and lower temperatures, we can gain more efficiency. And also with new part L regulations that require us to design central heating systems to maximum 55 degree C flow, you no longer be able to use a standard S or Y plan because with 55 degree C flow, you won't be able to heat up the cylinder to 60 degrees. 
So the only way to do that is actually using hot water priority setups and we will all have to start installing them on all jobs. Unfortunately, not all boilers are compatible with uh, those kind of setups. So manufacturers will have to step up and upgrade their boilers as well. So I don't think it will be possible to install S or Y plants any longer and comply with new building regulation parallel. So we will all have to start doing those setups. And as you can see here, this boiler is running weather compensated at 46 degrees C because it's quite warm outside. Although our curve is quite high because of the undersized radiators. Now, when it comes to uh, storage of hot water, we've got 200 liters and we've got three bathrooms here and three people at the property. So we swapped 375 liters for 200 liters. However, the stored water is not an issue anymore because of two things. It's a uh, hot water priority setup, so the water can be recharged very quickly thanks to a relatively large boiler that does 27 kilowatts into 200 liter store. It's also a high gain store, which allows for slightly more efficient water production and quicker water production. And to give you an idea, if you were to raise the temperature in the store from uh, 15 degrees to 60, which is Delta T45, it takes 23 minutes to reheat the full cylinder. So if it takes 23 minutes to reheat 200 liters of water, if you use one outlet, you pretty much never run out of hot water anyway. So now tell me below in the comments, what did you expect I was actually installing here and what were you expecting in terms of hot water capacity and kilowatt output of the boiler? And now for my least favorite part of the job, lagging, as per you watching that.